All right. So for today's Slow Hour Friday, we're going to be looking at the three images that are on your screen. And these images are all from a special exhibit that's the rural avant-garde, the mountain lake experience. I wanted to kind of just give you some background on the mountain lake experience. It might help help us as we look at the different images and have our discussion today. So the Mountain Lake originated as a workshop in 1980, and it was a series of conferences founded by an artist and curator named Ray Koss, and it, and it co-directed by an art historian named Howard Rosati. So in 1983, those evolved into an ongoing art project where they would have an annual session held at a rural retreat center in Mountain Lake, Virginia, which is in southwestern Virginia, not far from, from where we are today in Asheville. And this, this exhibition showcases a selection of creative works that emerged from nearly four decades of the Mountain Lake Workshop situated in Southern Appalachia, which as you know, Appalachian art is a focus of the Asheville Art Museum. The Mountain Lake experience um, was actually kind of grew out of the Black Mountain College artist. And if you're familiar with Black Mountain College, that was a um, experimental liberal arts college that was in Black Mountain, North Carolina, just about 15 miles um, east of here. It was founded in 1937. And part of the goal of the Black Mountain College was, as we said, as I said, it was experimental. And it, art was included or woven into all of the curricula. No matter what your major was, art was woven into it. And um, some other aspects of Black Mountain College is it was very self-directed. All students had to work and all students decided when they were ready for graduation. So some folks might take 10 years before they figured their education was complete. Others might at the end of one year say, hey, I've learned what I want to learn. I'm ready to graduate. Uh, Black Mountain College did um, cease to exist in, in the mid-1950s due to a lack of funding. The campus is still there in Black Mountain and now is occupied by a camp, Camp Rock Mount. It, so participants in the Mountain Lake experience, just like participants in, the, um, in Black Mountain College, were encouraged to take risks, try new techniques, and experiment with a term Interdeterminacy, which was a term used by a composer and artist, John Cage, who was a Black Mountain alumnus, and that approach favored a reliance on chance and a trust in several possible results instead of careful planning. So in other words, most artists, if they're going to say paint a tree or a still life, it's well thought out. They take sketches, they arrange things, you know, they worry about balance and color and all that, whereas part of the Mount Lake experience was to leave a lot of those aspects up to chance, kind of based on the fact that man's way of thinking was not necessarily the right way. So chance was a big part of the Black, uh, the Mountain Lake experience. Also collaboration. They, um, a lot of the artwork was collaboration between artists, but also between the community. So a lot of times in the artwork, the community was just as involved as the artist was. So with that said, we'll go ahead and look at some artworks. Uh, for those of you that may be new to Slow Art Friday, um, I'll give you a few moments to look at the artwork, then I'm gonna ask you some questions and we're just gonna kind of talk about what we see. So any questions before we start? All righty. So take a few moments and look at this artwork and then we'll talk about it. Okay, what do you think is going on in this artwork? Well, it almost looks like a picture of uh, outer space or the universe or something in that order, but, but not quite. <laughs> hmm. So, I guess uh, I'm trying to relate it to something that I would know. But I think your observations are good when that you sort of see an outer space look to it is how I'll put it, but 
And, mm -hmm. and what do you see that kind of makes you, gives you that feeling? Well, gee, I don't, kind of a infinity look, like there's uh, no, no definite stopping point. You're looking into the picture and it goes on and on and on away from you. So I, I like that, the fact that, as you say, it, it, there's no beginning and no end. It just kind of goes into the picture and there, mm. there's no end in sight. So good observation. What else can we see? For me, I, I see two different images. Uh, there seems to be a line coming down the middle. And on the left, it looks like a mountain. And there's some kind of storm or chaos. There's something circular on the left. And then the image on the right looks like it exploded in, the, in a storm is what I see. So, so Michael, let me ask you a couple of questions about, about your observation then. So <laughs> make sure I got this right. So the left, like you said, there's a, a mountain type image in the center and then all that chaos or storm surrounding it. And then is it look to you like the right is sort of like the after picture? Yeah, like there's been some sort of explosion or mm -hmm. storm. Yeah, I'm seeing... To me, it looks like electricity current, which kind of fits with the whole idea of a current on the left-hand side. And then I see clarity, you know, the storm moving away um, and, and opening up to whatever was behind it, which could be a mountain, which could be, um, you know, it could be a before and after, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing an opening uh, as opposed to an explosion. I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing more chaos on the left and I'm seeing on the right-hand side, clarity, opening, um, less chaos. So I, I like that, the you see, and I can't argue with any of you about the chaos or the <laughs> look of chaos on the mm -hmm. left there. It's, I have to agree 100% with that. But I like what you said about the one on the right, that the chaos is kind of created sort of an opening and we can now see more into the into the image than in the left than on the left side. So excellent. Anybody else? What else can we see? To me, it almost looks like with Halloween coming up that it almost looks ghost-like and um, maybe mm -hmm. all of the white people taking toilet paper and putting it around the trees oh. on mischief night mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lighting of the ghosts and it reminds me of Halloween coming up right now. <laughs> I, I kind of caught that. I thought, well, maybe, maybe Halloween is, is, got, is biasing your view, but it's all valid that, that it does kind of, you could, you could definitely see a supernatural kind of uh, effect going on in, in both images. And I like that it's, they've been toilet papered. So. And on the right, Yes. Um, I was going to say on the right hand side, there is light coming out from, you know, the, the, I don't want to call it the sun coming out, but there's some light coming out from the back, as opposed to you're not seeing any of that on the left hand side. So, so yeah, it's, it's, like right along the edge of what? Right, right. The mountain. Right. Also, I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you, Jacqueline. Oh, good. <clears throat> Uh, I agree, I see that, but you know, on the right, I see trees on the top of a mountain that are in a storm that are <clears throat> those little, little uh, things on top to be a, appear to be beaten over by the storm. And it's a different kind of storm on the right than it is on the left, as has been said. So, um, do you think the right image then or the right side of the image, because it's actually one image, but it could have been created as two parts, I don't know. Um, do you think it's maybe a different view then or just the same view closer in or? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it, it has a different meaning, it seems to me. Well, I think one of the things we can see too, though, that there is a similar shape in the, um, yes. 
I don't know what to triangular or something, you know, we're coming up to a point with the dark in the middle. So there's a similarity here. And then we have the white um, trails going all through the paintings. Hmm. So, um, so I think what I'm hearing is that it could be the same image well, um, or the same thing that we're looking at, just either a different view or like we, we kind of mentioned before, maybe a before and after, you know, maybe the right side is after the storm. And so the, obviously the, the uh, mountain or whatever it is might have been disturbed because the chaos looks a little less to me in the right side image or the right side of this image. Yes. Mm -hmm. So excellent observations. Any, anybody else have anything? So let's go ahead then and we will look at the, um, it is called meta, metempsychosis diptych number one. Um, as we mentioned, a big part of the Mountain Lake experience was collaboration. So as you see here, um, there were three artists collaborated. This is laser imagery, oil paint, photo emulsion, and developer on photographic rag paper. So it's, it's kind of a, a very much an interdisciplinary effort between paint, photography, and then even laser imagery. So that also speaks to that that collaboration, that experimental um, side of the Mountain Lake experience. And also, I would say if we were to look at these images, there was a fair amount of chance involved in how the image was created. And there again, I don't know, and the artists aren't really here to tell us how, what exactly their process was, but it does not look that deliberate to me, what we see in the image. It looks like there was a fair amount of chance in there and as far as how the, the chaos, as we described it, um, appears on the images. But don't know for sure, but I would say that. So just to give you a little information on these artists. So in the Metapsychosis Workshop, Liz Liguri collaborated with Jesse Mann and her mother, photographer Sally Mann, in manipulating photographic process to achieve visual imagery akin to painting. So they took photography and made it look similar to painting. The collaboration offered a way for the artist to explore a shift in photography from direct representation to abstract, deconstructed, and process-based art form. The term metempsychosis refers to the transmigration of the soul, especially in reincarnation. In this context, the souls of the original photographs were transformed and reborn as new images to the application of pigments, chemicals, and other actions. So any comments on all that? Well, I don't know how we didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Exactly. And, you know, if for those of you that... Um, our local. This is a current exhibition at the, at the museum, and it's I really enjoy it because besides the the imagery, it's also very much a lot of conceptual art. Sort of like this is where you know the image is important, but also all the all the other information about the image. For example, when I just the stuff I just gave you about this image is very much a part of the exhibit right. and a part of what the artist was mindset when they did these images. So, so very good. Any, any last comments before we move to the next one? All right. So take a few minutes and look at this and then we will talk about it. So, all right, what do you think's going on here? Oops, sorry about that. Well, the only thing I can read <laughs> is the where it says the empty road. 
it's just too small to see any of the other print. Um, and let me, it is, it is a kind of a uh, busy work and not, you know, on this screen, we lose a lot, but let's see if we can um, sort of give you a little bit of a zoom there. Well, I see that it has some, I would believe, religious overtones. It talks about prophecy in one of the spaces, and it talks about, um, I just lost it now, Jesus. Yeah. Um, oh, goodness, it keeps running around. Jesus speaks, I am the way of the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. So there's... But I also see a landscape here, uh, which looks to me like it would be the sun and clouds and mountains and the lots of things going on. Recording. Um. I'm not sure what that is. So. Anyway, uh, oh, does dear. somebody have a second screen going or there we better. So whatever that was is gone. Okay. So um, sorry about that. So what I heard you say is you see a lot about prophecy. You you um, you saw some um, religious verbiage there around, you know, Jesus is the light in the way. Um, and then you see this rather elaborate landscape. So there, there is a lot to unpack here. So what else can we see? So I think at the very lower end, it explained what the empty road was. I at think the bottom? It, at the very bottom when you, where you first focused. Okay, just right there. This is your empty road from earth to, to heaven. So I guess the bottom part is supposed to be the landscape of earth with combination of nature. I mean, I'm seeing mountains and trees and then these buildings, which I don't know if they are churches, you know, given the religious overtones, maybe there is something of that. And there is always the snake there, you know, the, the, the problematic snake <laughs> uh, that is everywhere in the earth. And then in the uh, in the upper half, which is supposed to be heaven, it all seems organized, you know, not as chaotic. Um, I'm not seeing the snake. I'm seeing sunshine. I'm seeing planets. And I guess that's heaven. It's interesting uh -huh. how the road goes through the tunnels of the, of the clouds and the mountains mm -hmm. and that there's not just birds in the sky, they almost look like spaceships or rockets. Right, right. And um, how, how striking it is that you've got two colors here. I mean, this vibrant mm -hmm. on my screen, it's an orange tone there, reddish orange and white. And um, it really just kind of stands out, tremendous detail, so. Yeah. And, and I agree, I love the spaceships in heaven, uh, look of it. Who knows, but, but I really kind of find that imagery very fun. But I also noticed what you said, how the road goes through, first it goes through the mountain and then it goes through the clouds. And when it goes, when it goes in the bottom half, the road does look empty because it is no color, you know, it's just lines. And when it traverses to heaven, the road seems full. You know, there's, there's color there. You know, it's been filled in. Right, it's darker and even says, you know, if you look right there, it says the empty road. So you're exactly. Mm -hmm. So what can we what make of all the different structures? You know, the snake, I think, is pretty self-explanatory, but any thoughts about all the different structures in here? These cathedrals or? I'm sorry, could be what? Are they cathedrals, maybe? Could be. Could be. 
Well, somebody's taken great pains to illustrate their thoughts, for sure, with the buildings and the animals and trees. And I'm looking over at the very right side uh, by the pointy structure. It says, if you can't see that we are in the last days, you are far behind time. Wake up now. Ooh. So I think there's a dire warning here also. I mean, it's obviously a lot from the Bible, a lot of religious connotations. And this person's thoughts on Jesus saving us and, and looking to God for our you know, help. And that's very interesting, but certainly very, very intricate in all the, the texts and the writings and the thoughts are well illustrated by this person. So, uh, and you're exactly right. It's it's a lot of work. Um, it's been put into it. You could probably spend a couple hours or longer just reading everything here. Mm -hmm. So, um, with that said, the person, the artist, any thoughts on what his or her background might be? I'll put it a different way. What do you think their day job is? <laughs> I mean, it's an illustration uh, as opposed to well, so, uh, um, I mean, the day job could be anything. We just could be any person thoughts during the day. Well, and you're right. You're right. It, it could be any person just putting down thoughts. But if you look at the thoughts they put down, that would lead me to think their day job is probably um, something, something along, something to do with religion. Um, and, and I'll be honest, this is actually the, the artist is, is a preacher. So, um, so that's a very big influence on his work is obviously his, his faith. And we can see that. But any other thoughts on this or anything else we can see? Let me go back to the top. We haven't spent, it's time for us to take a trip up to the top here. Well, I think it, um, I think that the, the haystacks or the mountains, I see a lot of flame imagery and the, the snakes wrapping around. Um, so it, it, it doesn't paint a very um, pleasant picture for, for life on the earth. And then you see the people in the built in the, the cathedrals or the cities, they're sort of standing in the windows like they want to be rescued. You know, they, they, there's not a person in every window. Um, it, I'm good observation, yeah, the way those folks are all um in the windows like you said like they're waiting to be rescued and the and the snake wrapping through there is, is potentially the threat or what they want to be rescued from which would fit very much i think with the theology behind this so hank it's micah can you go back up to the top i i i feel like the bottom section is pretty clear as we've discussed it but i find you know certain messages uh, fascinating up in wherever, whatever this is, heaven, I guess we've decided. Like earth has center, center fire, like fire of the sun. I can't read it, keep, keep it in perfect orbit. I'm just trying to, to absorb more of, of what the message is in this upper region. Well, I don't know, as I looked at it at first, I got a um, uplifting feeling and I think it was mostly the colors and the organization of the writings and we could identify clouds and mountains that it seemed, um, but the more I read of this person's thoughts, I'm not getting a happy religious experience. I'm getting kind of you better hurry up and mend your ways and this could be the end and it's the last time I'm gonna tell you. You know, I'm getting a, um, a dire consequences if you don't follow the word of God and you know, obviously interpreted as this person's interpreting. So 
I'm finding kind of a conflict in those two things, the message in the words mm. and, and the drawing, which is, I don't know, I like the drawing. This one says, life always pays back the good things you do for others. It works also the other way around. It's just mm. really interesting and all the flying creatures and yeah. spaceships and rockets. It's, it's kind of bizarre. Mm -hmm. it's, um, and I, I think to the previous point, um, to Sharon's point, it very much um, has that sort of fire and brimstone type um, religion behind it, or it appears that way. But there are some little pockets of good stuff, as you pointed out. The uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the thing about life, and it seems to me that the the words and the little bubbles in heaven um, seem much more positive than the words down below. Mm. You know, not that they're like all great, but the ones below are very much gloom and doom and prophecy of doom and so on. So anybody else have any thoughts on this one? Well, that's interesting because that you say that the, the message gets more positive as you, as you journey up to heaven. Cause I, I hadn't, I haven't been able to read, read all of this, obviously. Um, but that's interesting. Right. And that's just at first glance. I have not read the whole thing, I'll be honest. So, all right. Well, let's take a look at, at the... Uh... So it is Empty Road, as we talked about. So if the artist is Howard Finster. It is a screen print on paper. Um, there was an edition of 150. So mm -hmm. Howard Finster... Um, sought to create what he termed sacred art. And he was a preacher. Howard Finster was a preacher from Alabama. Um, once he recognized a particular image as revelatory, he would make an outline stencil of that and he would call that a dimension. D-E-M-E-N-T-I-O-N. -E -E not to be confused with uh, like three dimensions. He felt that each dimension stencil took on a life of its own and existed as a potential experience and creative image for anyone who used it. A single dimension could be used to make hundreds of artworks. So hence there is that, that, um, that collaboration that we talked about as a mountain lake workshop focus. So even though Howard created the original stencil or the original screen print, uh, that stencil could be used by many others to continue to spread the word, so to speak. So there was a a collaboration effort. So a couple other things in the 1980s and 90s, Howard Finster became one of the best known self-taught artists. So he is not a trained artist. He's self-taught or what some folks call folk artists. And his work was actually featured on a couple of album covers. One was the rock band REM, the other one was Talking Heads. And then those artworks which are also on view in the museum right now, engage with popular culture. And Howard looked at those album covers. You might think, well, gee, that could be a conflict. Uh, uh, you know, a fire and brimstone preacher having artwork on a rock album cover. But he kind of looked at that as, as a way to continue to spread the word because if that artist, that uh, musical artist sold millions of albums, that millions of people would see um, Howard Finster's sacred artwork. So not a bad attitude. And he's from Alabama, I mean, from Georgia. And he actually, I think it still is there today. He's, he's meanwhile passed away, but he had a huge um, park where he bought, I think, four acres and tried to reproduce every notable building in the world. So there's reproductions of all kinds of buildings there. Tons of his folk art. It's kind of a destination. So any last comments on Howard Finster or Empty Road before we move on? All right. Let's take a look at this.
So what do we think is going on with this artwork? I really like it with the three-dimensional gold in the center and the, the, the three shades of blue with the sky in the background and the, 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 the green in the forefront. Um, it, it looks like screens of some sort and um, just um, looks nice. So, and, and just to clarify, because I think you hit it on the head, the 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 photograph is not the artwork the screens and where they're located is actually what we're looking at so make sure that we're all clear on that so but um so say more about the gold and, and the actual screen any thoughts on that what what that brings to mind well i was trying to decide whether it was a photograph or a painting of some sort so now you've cleared that up I don't know what to say. Uh, the Wailing Wall comes to mind, although this doesn't really look like the Wailing Wall, but <laughs> I don't know. There's something about it, which looks I had, like, I had doesn't this... look like stone. I don't know what the, what is that? I had to step away for a moment, but did anybody mention Stonehenge? No. Well, we did. Uh, no, but she mentioned the Wailing Wall and now Stonehenge, so there's... Um, several things that it's reminding you of. I kind of like that. So what else can we see? The gold is interesting to me. It's um, the, because it, you know, it, it, it just seems out of, it's not what you'd expect um, to see in nature. You know, something with gold leaf paint and it's, and it just sort of, you know, it looks sort of um, cobbled together or, you know, perhaps several artists each created the individual panels. And so it intentionally doesn't, it's not symmetrical. Um, the panels don't match. But then this care has been taken to put this, you know, gold leaf paint. So it, don't, it almost looks like a fortress of some sort, or maybe a little gothic. It's uh, and yet some are connected, and some seem to have spaces between them. So it's hard to ascertain actually how many pieces there actually are, and whether you could like take this apart and re put it back together differently. Well, and, and um, those are all excellent observations, everyone's. I, I, you know, let's kind of go back to Megan's. The gold, you know, it, it does seem kind of out of place in the middle of a field. It's not often you find a gold leaf in nature like that. Um, I, and also the inconsistency of the panels. It's not uniform. Um, and then to, to Laurel's point, it can be moved because... Um, just so you know, there's actually a section of this in the in the gallery at the museum. The actual um, pieces of wood there. So I stepped I stepped back um, and had a totally different take on it. It looked like a cityscape to me, like a skyline from a distance. I can see that because um, it does the the. The tops of the panels do kind of have an architectural look to them. So yeah. So let's let's think about what this is. Um, it's sort of a wall, sort of a screen. And, and what do walls and screens typically? What do they function? What's their function? To to separate space spaces. Right, separate spaces. And what else can they do? Create a sound barrier. <laughs> They're a sound barrier. And they bring definition, yeah, to, to a landscape here. They change the definition of the landscape. Yes, very good. So, you know, and, and let's go back to, I think it was Jacqueline said that they, um, they separate spaces. And what else can they separate? Well, they can hide something. I mean, we don't know what's behind these screens. Separate people, separate us from nature. 
Right. The, you know, and those points are both very um, relevant. I think the fact that it can, like I said, they second separate people either from each other or from nature. Um, they can hide things. But let's kind of go to the one about Laurel where she said they can hide things. If we look at this screen, the wall, it's not really that effective at completely hiding things, is it? No. Because there's gaps in it. Um, and if you were actually able to look at a panel close up, you could see that there's holes in the panels. They're not solid. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not wood, I don't think, but it looks almost like a, some kind of wire or something that they've put plaster on and then painted the plaster to me. I was trying to decide what it was would be made out of, which I bet you know, and you can tell us later. <laughs> so, so let's go ahead. Anybody else have anything? Because I want to kind of talk about what this is, because that will maybe change your viewpoint. But before we do that, anybody else have anything? Just one thing. You know, Go ahead. It, I'm sorry. It, it ahead. looks quite beautiful just as it is, mm -hmm. without any interpretation. The differences in colors, the difference in light and dark. I love it. Do we know if the back is the same? I mean, all around, if like you turned it, all the pieces around, would the back look the same to us? Exactly, yes, Laura. So if we were on the other side of this, we would be seeing a very similar view. Mm. I think it would be a wonderful backdrop for an outdoor performance of some kind. Um, and someone met Stonehenge and I thought, you know, how interesting that when you, if you see a, the Druids who are putting on a ceremony or whatever, this kind of thing is so, it reminds us of just a natural setting for things that might happen whether it's a ceremony or some kind of a play or something like that. Yeah, it would. It would make a, a good backdrop. And interesting, you should, um, you should mention the ceremony. So just to um, fill you on in, this is actually, the name of this is called Tachi, T-A-C-H-I. Let's go ahead and we'll go to that screen. So it is um, by an Asian artist, Jiro Okura. It is synthetic gold leaf on walnut. And what this represents, according to the artist, is the folding screen represents the porous or movable wall between Eastern and Western cultures. So even though um, it can separate people, it can separate us from nature, it can also separate cultures because, you know, Eastern and Western cultures are, are a bit different. But as as we talked about, or as, as Laura brought up the question, it is a movable wall. So it doesn't mean it's finished. It doesn't mean there's a fixed divide between East and West. And it's also porous. As we said, there are spaces you can walk through. There's holes in the wood you can walk through. And that also represents um, the view of the two cultures. We can see the other culture. We can go across through the screen and share in that culture. The other culture can come into our culture. We can see it. So, um, and the wood for the screen came from eight black walnut trees harvested from the Jefferson National Forest at Littlestone Mountain, Virginia. And the trees were selected in cooperation with the U.S. Forest Service and cut following a traditional Japanese Shinto ceremony to bless and honor the trees. So somebody earlier said this might make a good backdrop for a ceremony. So I think you were you were feeding right into where the artist was was going with this. And the screen was created using nearly 60 community members over a seven-week period using both modern and traditional carving tools. And once completed, the panels were painted with calligraphic strokes and then overlaid with gold leaf. And these treatments are often associated with Japanese temples and other furnishings. So um, if we think about the two main tenets we've talked about, collaboration and chance, and collaboration is pretty obvious. As I said, there were 70 um, community members involved in, in making this artwork. They collaborated with the Forest Service to 
um, select the trees to, to harvest. But what do you think of the chance aspect of this is? Well, the panels are all different. Exactly. The panels are different. So the, you know, um, again, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, a lot of artists, everything is very planned and choreographed. But in this case, who chose the, the trees to cut down? The U.S. Forest Service, not the artists. So there was an element of chance in the trees that the Forest Service would select versus the trees the artists would select. And then just within the trees, each tree is different. You know, you can't predetermine when you cut down a tree what the wood inside is going to look like. There's a huge element of chance there is once you cut the tree open, what are you going to find? And you can see that each one of these, is, as Megan pointed out, is very different. And that's very much that aspect of chance. But they're still beautiful, even though the, the design was created as a collaboration of community members, a bit of chance in there. So the artist had less control than if he had been 100% responsible from start to finish. It still makes a beautiful image. And that's very much what the Mountain Lake experience um, was looking for in, in, in their whole, part of the whole reason to be was to look at that. Do you know what the mountain has to do with it? I'm sorry? The, the mountain lake, it just... Um... The Mountain Lake is just where the Mountain Lake workshop was held in Mountain Lake, Virginia for oh, decades. Okay. Um, and Mountain Lake is just a, a town in Virginia, in Southwest Virginia, so not far from here. So it's just called Mountain Lake Screen because that's where the artists and the um, collaborators created this. And then the, the trees are from a nearby, a nearby forest. Um, mm -hmm. The Mount Lake Experience has, I think 2010 was their last um, get together. Although if you go to their website, it still exists. It doesn't talk about them being anything being completed. It does not also talk about any future plans. So it's unknown if the Mount Lake Experience might be um, revived or not. Um, is it the same artist that has the panels in the um, in the um, oh the, the cage show? Yes. Mm -hmm. So in the in the show that's currently at the at the museum, the um, a section of the this is in the front of the gallery, and then in the back of the gallery. There's another similar piece as far as its, its tall wooden structures kind of forming a screen. He also did that piece, if that's what you're asking about, um, slightly different um, method there in that in that piece, they actually um, took um, branches and laid them down on the wood and then painted. So where the branches were, it kind of made a negative image. So there again, that bit of chance and also it was community members that painted those. So similar aspects to, to both of these works, but same artists. Um, I may have missed um, something on this. Is there any relevance that these screens are sitting in nature? I mean, it, you said something about it's, it's you know, the, the uh, the back and forth between East and West. Um, does the fact that it's taking place in nature have anything to do with it? Is, is that the most neutral ground is nature or, um, I don't know, I was wondering. Well, yeah. and it's a good question and I don't really know. And that's one of those, you know, questions that if we had the artist here, we could ask and, and he might not even have a good answer for that. But I think it's a very valid point because um, it's a natural, uh, material the wood, even though the gold has been applied, and I think the the wall between East and Western cultures would certainly not be in, in a building; it would be out in nature like this. So I think that's a valid point. Any other comments? Um. Well, if it's uh, I um. I did a, a little research on this artist uh, for a tour, and I 
I, if it's okay, I could just read a quote from the artist. Please do. Um, he says, I was hooked on wood. By working with wood, I discovered a way to confirm not only my own existence, but also the vast presence of nature of the entire cosmos surrounding me. Um, and he says, in this piece of wood, his experience of vast empty space was fused with material substance into a powerful metaphor for a consciousness of existence. And I love seeing it in this image that you have. It's a lot more powerful, I think, than, than seeing it in person in the museum. I love this image of it in the mountains. <laughs> And, and, and thanks for, I think I love that quote. So thanks. Yeah. And also, I think as Megan pointed out, with these, you know, here we're using the mountains for scale. So they look kind of small, but in the museum, when you're standing next to these panels, they're actually quite large. All right. I just wanted to say, I. I love this piece. I love it. And <clears throat> I love everything about it. The collaborative nature of the project. Um, really looking forward to coming into the museum and, and seeing it. Um, and I agree. It's, you know, um, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an exhibit you want to spend some time in because it's not one of those exhibits you can just walk through and go, oh, what a pretty picture, what a pretty painting or whatever, um, because it is, you know, so much of it is the conceptual side of these artworks that you really want to stop and think about it and, and kind of understand what the artists and the collaborators were doing. So, so yeah, it's, it's a great exhibit though. I highly recommend it. I've enjoyed it. All right. So there's our images. Um, any last? I see something over the chat. Hang on. So. Distortion. Oh, oh, that was me. I, I started typing something that I I can delete it. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was that? Oh, I well, I started a message to you, but I can I'll delete it. So I don't know if that's what you're seeing or not. Um, I just said thanks so much, Hank, because you had to be Paige today and Hank today. So thank you very much. <laughs> I uh, enjoyed being Paige. Thank and, you. And then please join us next month. November the 5th will be the next Thor Friday. You'll have me again as Paige and myself. And um, we'll be looking at modernist design at Black Mountain College. So as I mentioned, this is a sort of an outgrowth of the Black Mountain College and way of thinking. So we'll get into some more Black Mountain College in November the 5th at same time, same place. Great. Thank you. Thank you Thank all you very much. much. Thank you. It was wonderful.